All right, so let's talk about workflow. Um, this is extremely important because it kind of begins the way that we actually want to work within our studio. Um, and there are several things to think about. Um, and they all kind of lead to the idea of reproducibility. How can we increase the re um, uh, reproducibility of the projects that we work on, the reports that we generate, the analyses that we actually perform? All right, so there's going to be three main things that we think about uh, for workflow considerations. One is kind of having a project-oriented workflow. Two is how do we actually have efficient and reproducible deliverables? And the third is version control. We're gonna talk about the first two in this module. We do not hit on version control very much, but I'll give you resources uh, that you can learn more about that. And that is definitely something that you wanna spend time uh, focusing on and learning more about. All right, so the first thing, project-oriented workflow, right? So great quote here, organization is what you do before you do something so that when you do it, it is not all mixed up, right? And this is a classic thing that we see in a lot of projects. All right, so when we first learn R, what do we typically do? Well, we open R, and you can see I got RStudio open on the right. And the first thing I do is start up a new script where I'm gonna do some coding. And now the thing is, where I save this, and where I actually am operating within RStudio is all dependent on um, where our studio opens from originally. So in this case, when I open this up, right, we can get our working directory. This is where we're working from, and we see it's just in my home. But typically when we do project reports um, or uh, project um, analysis projects, we're gonna do that um, and have a lot of the content in an, a subdirectory, some folder on our computer where we host and keep all, whether it's the data, the reports we generate, the R code that we um, we use to generate the analyses and so on, right? So right now what I'd have to do is I have to go find, I open up R, I have to go find, let's see, maybe I've got um, a directory somewhere on my folder, I've got projects here, and then I can go into the folder and I'm going to set my working directory, whether I do that through this tab where I hit set working directory, or you can see in the slide here, I can manually set it to whatever path I want. Right, so that is a common way that when we first start using our studio, we get, we get going on working and identifying the directory we wanna operate in. All right, there is a big problem with this. Um, one is when we set our working directory manually in that way, whether we use the set WD function or manually through our studio, um, it is very specific to our own home, um, our, our laptop, our computer that we're using, which who knows, maybe in two years we have a new computer and we may have our project paths um, set up differently. We may be storing and organizing our folders on our computer in a different way. Um, at the second that happens, then the second that we don't have a reproducible workflow anymore, right? We'd have to go back and manually reset our um, our working directory for our studio. Also, if we share code, we share scripts, um, anything where we reference a directory path within our scripts is likely not to work, not going to work for other folks, right? And when we do data analysis in the real world, not just classroom, we're gonna do a lot of work with other, other data scientists and we need to have our scripts be able to generalize regardless of the computer or the server it's, it's running on, all right? Now, often what we also do is we may jump from project to project in the same um, R session. And so lots of times what we do is we just run this RM list equals LS that clears out my entire global environment or maybe we go ahead and hit this um, broom uh, to clean up our global environment um, rather than creating a fresh new R session. And there's problems with that because certain things will carry over. Did we load a package in, in the first R session that automatically gets carried over to this new R session that we're working on? Um, we forget to load a, a package by using library package. Um, it's already loaded, so the code works now. But the second I close this down, and I or someone else opens up that script, it's not gonna work, right? So there's just a lot of issues with this kind of a workflow, um, and it really reduces the organization and reproducibility 
of our projects. All right, so when we think about workflow um, or how we, we do analysis, we need to be thinking of two different parts, workflow and the product, right? The workflow are the things that you do um, because it's, it's how we operate when we write code, right? It is the code or text editor that we use, which in this case is usually our studio. It's the directory paths that we may have on our computer um, or the operating system. Some of us work on Macs, others work on Windows. How do we make sure that our analysis generalizes between those two? Um, so that all has to do with the, with the workflow. The other thing is we produce products, right? Products are the logic and the output that is the essence of our project, right? The actual output of our data analysis. This includes the R code someone may need to run on a raw data set. Um, it also includes some raw data that may be leveraged in a project, right? And the, the goal here is we don't wanna hardwire anything about our workflow here into our product, right? So whatever our output is for an analysis, we don't wanna have things that are hard-coded around our directory paths um, or operating system injected into that product because somebody else will not be able to reproduce that product if we do that. All right, so what's the best practice? Um, well, one, we want to organize each data analysis into its own project, right? A folder on your computer that holds all the files relevant to that particular piece of work. And this is, you think about, you know, when you uh, organize your work for your classes, um, for maybe each module or session that you're doing, maybe your homework, you're typically organizing these into certain directories on your computer. And we want to do the same thing with our, our code. Uh, any resident R script is written assuming that it will be run from a fresh R environment, right? So we want to have everything that we need to reproduce our R code, our R script, um, in our script alone, right? We don't want to have assumptions that data is already loaded and then we just simply have the code to analyze that data in our script. We want to have both the loading of the data and the analysis of our data in that R script. And we want the working directory to be set to the project directory, right? So when we open up a project, we'd like our working directory to automatically be set to that folder that we're operating in, right? So how can we do this? Well, we can do this with what is called our projects, right? So our projects, what we can do, let's go ahead and create one. And if you see this cube in my upper right hand corner, if I click on that, you see new R project and this will load. And you can choose to either start a project in a new directory or an existing directory. So let's start in a new directory. Let's go ahead and say, we're just gonna choose new project here. And let's just say you're gonna create this project for this class, right? So you might say UC Bana, and depending on the class that you're you're watching this in, which is either gonna be 725 or 7025 or 4080, right? I'll create that um, directory name. And let's just, I'll go ahead and put that on my desktop. And I'm going to create my project. All right, so now let's go ahead and flip out. We can see a couple of things here. We can see on my desktop, I now have a new folder that was created. This is a directory called UC Bana 7025, which was a project I just created. If I were to open this up, I see now I have this cube here. All right, so let me go ahead. I'm gonna close R down. What I can do now is just go ahead and double click on this project. And what happens is it will open my R Studio, and this R Studio is going to be set where the default working directory is in that folder. All right, so now I can save all the information, all the files, all the data, everything I need for this project, or in this case, this class, all in this directory, and it will be a subdirectory of the project I'm working on. Also, if I go ahead, let's say I create my script here. I'm going to save this. And let's go ahead and save this as my, well, now this would be my second R script. 
And by default, it will save that script directly within the project directory I created, right? And a couple other nice things, if I were to close this down, right? And let's say I wanna go back in this project and do some more work. When I open this up, what'll happen is any scripts that I had open and that I was working on when I closed down this project will automatically be loaded and um, ready to go to do some work on when I open up this project. Also, the history, if I look at the history within this project, the R code history will only be the code that was directly related to this project. So if I work on a different project and I have a bunch of code written, if I were to look at the history, you would not see the history from this project in that one. Okay, so it, it isolates the project and the code associated with each project. All right, so what I want you to do is go ahead and create an R project for this class. All right, so what is different with this R project? Well, we talked about a few different things. Um, the idea that you will see this cube within our directory where it holds that R project. Um, and I already mentioned how when we open up the, um, the R project by double clicking on that cube, it will open up a new R session that is related to that project. Now, there are a few things that are good to know. Um, there is what's called a dot R profile that is in the project's main directory, and that'll be source. Now, we don't necessarily see that uh, when I look over here in the directory because that's actually a hidden file. Um, let's see, I think if I go ahead and see here, you can see I have hidden files that you can see in my directory. There is this dot R proj user, right, in dot R dot r history right these are hidden um, files that are sourced and included in that is this dot r profile um, what that means is you could actually have unique profile for the project that um, um, automatically changes the behavior you don't need to worry about that that's a little bit more advanced than we want to get into in this course but just realize that we could actually personalize projects um, with extra code so that it operates in unique ways uh, there will be a .r history file, right? And I already mentioned how the history, the source code history that you can see within the project will be isolated to this project. And that's because the .r history will be unique only to this project, which is this other hidden file. Now, there are also some RStudio settings that we could set. So we can set global settings within RStudio, right? Which we see here. Global settings are like, how do I want the appearance to be? Do I want to have a uh, dark background? Do I want to have um, the pane layouts to be a certain way? But there are also project options that I can set, right? And these project um, sessions can include, do I want to restore a .r data? Uh, typically, we don't want to do that. Um, and there's other things around code editing. So we could have different tab widths for this uh, particular project. We could have unique things around our markdown. We're gonna talk about our markdown in the next lesson and so on. So just realize that you can kind of customize individual project options um, if you desire. All right, so one thing to be thinking about is when we have an R project, right, typically, we're gonna have subdirectories in there. And what you see in this slide is very common ways that people often set up their R projects for a typical data analysis in an organization. The, basically, the two different ways are you have your different scripts isolated for certain parts of that project, maybe cleaning the data, doing some exploratory data analysis, and then doing some machine learning modeling. And then you may have a directory where we hold raw data. Another option is what we see on the right here, where we have a subdirectory in that main R project that contains all the .R scripts that we use, and then a separate subdirectory for the different data sources that we use, right? 
So very similar here, but the slight difference is in just where do we hold our data and our code in subdirectories or all in the same directory as the R project. Well, when we do this, then what happens is the way that we access data from our R scripts can change. For example, when we have a R script at the top level, but we need to access data in this raw, or excuse me, the subdirectory where there's raw data, right? And so let's just say this subdirectory is called data. Then we can actually pass a path. So we're going to get into importing data here in a little bit, um, but this is just for illustrative purposes. What we're doing here is we're saying we want to import data. Let's say I'm in this clean R script. But what I need to do is reach into this data subdirectory and then reach down to this first data file called month01. Right, so I'm referencing a subdirectory here and then the file in that subdirectory. Now, say you had your R script saved into a subdirectory. So say instead of your R scripts at the top level, we have them saved in this subdirectory here. Now for us to go ahead and say, I want to reach in and grab data and access and, and import data from this subdirectory, what I actually need to do is say, I use this dot dot and that says, I want to go up from this directory to our main directory. And then I want to look down into the data directory, which is right here. And then into the month zero one um, file, right? So just realize the way that we hold our scripts in our data, whether it be in the top level directory or subdirectories within that project, that will dictate like how we reference our um, paths that we need to pass in other functions. So we can do this one of two ways. One, we can be very explicit. And here we could say like this is, I wanna reach down into the data subdirectory and then to this particular file. Um, here is one where I say I need to go up a directory and then down into the data directory and then into the file. And this is fine, but there are some problems here. Um, there's some differences between operating systems. Um, and then also depending on um, the maybe the server setup or somebody else's computer setup that they're using, we may run into problems with reproducibility. So a better way to do this is to use this here package. And we're going to see this throughout this course. So you're going to get more and more comfortable with the idea of referencing path, um, file paths and using the here package to do that. So if you run the, the here function, so let me go ahead, I'm going to run this. And what this is going to do is it's going to list the full path on my system to this project directory. Okay. So now I can actually use this and I can say, well, if there was a data directory, so let me actually go ahead and I'm going to add a directory in here called data. Let's just say that's where I hosted um, some data. I could now say here, and then I pass data, which is the name of a directory. And what that's going to do is that's going to build the path and it's going to build the path dependent on my operating system. So for me, it's a Mac for you, it's a windows, but what, what's going to happen here is it's going to ensure that the file path is consistent regardless of the user and also the operating system that they're on. Right. And we can continue to build on this. So if I actually had a CSV file in this directory, such as month zero one, right, I could build out the full path for that particular file um, just by adding either more subdirectories or the file names within here. All right, a couple extra thoughts here now. When not to use, or let's say when, when it's not required to use. Sometimes you'll be doing a, a single one-time analysis for your own use and that you're not going to share with other folks um, and it's just a very ad hoc analysis, then that's fine. We don't need to worry as much about reproducibility. Um, sometimes there are server settings where the workflow is already set up. And in that case, you would follow the organizational um, workflow versus um, injecting your own uh, workflow. 
And then also with productionized um, scripts. So when we put work into production, we often customize it to that production environment. For these, you don't need to worry about these three um, because most of the stuff in this class will be focused on um, all the other times when we want to use an R project and using the here function so we can have reproducibility with our paths. All right, so let's talk about creating deliverables in R. And really this is focused on how do we create uh, reproducible reports. And these can be uh, reports that are your typical like PDF or HTML full on report. It can be presentations and it can be dashboards. Uh, but we're gonna just look at just the entry level um, R markdown reports that we can start creating within our studio. All right, so why do we care about this? Well, typically when we do an analytic project, um, we have a couple things. We have the code that's used to generate the analysis and the results. And then we have the text or the information that we want to write down to inform the decision maker our uh, stakeholders, our manager, or whoever. Um, and the problem is when we have these separated, right, the code and the text separated, you know, typically these projects are very iterative. Um, we do some analysis, we update a report, um, we get some feedback from our manager, we go back, we have to update our code and analysis that gets new results, we have to go back and update the text. So <clears throat> when these things are separated, it makes this process um, difficult to stay in sync and to make sure that we are um, adequately tying our code and our results to the actual text and making sure that they align to one another. Well, <clears throat> when we use some kind of an integrated deliverable workflow, this makes it much easier because we can have one file where we have our code that does the analysis along with the text that we can write about the findings that we are um, generating okay and so that's really what we're gonna focus on with our markdown a way that we can kind of synchronize both the code that we use to do the analysis and the text that goes around in providing uh, more context around the results that we're finding all right so our markdown the idea one file that contains both text and code now the beautiful thing about our markdown is you write your code and your analysis and in, in your text all in one file. It's called the .rmd file. And then we can hit a single button and this button's gonna do some magic behind the scenes which we don't really care too much about. But on the end of that, we can get a report. And this report can be a PDF file, a Word document, an HTML um, file, or even slides, right? So. There's a lot of flexibility in the type of report we can generate, um, but the nice thing is it all follows from one, um, one file and one process to generate it. All right, so let's go ahead. We're gonna create our first R Markdown file. So let's go up to our file um, uh, icon here, where it's to create a, a new file. And I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna select this R Markdown. <clears throat> now you can put some stuff in here. So let's go ahead and just do my first report and I'll leave my name as the author and I'll leave the date uh, for today. Um, now <clears throat> I'm gonna, there, there's some output that we can select right up front where we can decide, do we want this to be an HTML output, a PDF, a Word? We can always change this after the fact. So typically I just leave it the default HTML. So let's hit okay. And what's gonna happen is there's going to be a basic output, um, kind of a, a template that they provide um, that we can follow and then modify, okay? Now, there are primarily three general components in this R Markdown file. The first one is what we call the YAML. Um, and if you've never heard of YAML, it's actually stands for yet another markdown language, but um, that's what we see up here. This is what we call um, YAML uh, syntax. The next part is general markdown. So you can see we have a bunch of text in here, right? Where we just are, it's as if you were writing in a Word document. Um, and we can actually 
write and format our text that goes into this report using what's called Markdown. And Markdown is a very simple text uh, editing language. And you can, you can do some very basic stuff such as italicize, bold, you can create headings and the like. And we'll see that as we go through. And then the third thing we have in here is what we call code chunks. So all this stuff right here, where we have these back ticks, and then it's followed by curly braces, right? That's a code chunk. So this is actually code that we can run. <clears throat> all right, so let's go ahead and kind of talk about each one of these. So we can see in our YAML, uh, we have the name of our report, right? So I can always modify the title. We have the author, we have the date, uh, and we can actually make this date to be dynamic. We'll see how we can do that a little bit later on. And then we have the output. So this is saying that we're gonna create an HTML document. Now there are other types of outputs that we can create. Okay, but for right now, we'll just keep the output as HTML. Now, next we have the general markdown, the text that we have, and the code chunks that I talked about. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna go up to my YAML here, and we can see how I've got different title, and I've got a different input for my date. So let's go ahead, I'm gonna update this, and if you wanna follow along, you definitely can. So I'm gonna do this R Markdown demo. And now here, instead of having this be a static date, what I can actually do is I could say, hey look, I want this to be A dynamic input. Now, what am I doing here? Well, this sysdate is actually a function. So we can run this, and when I run sysdate, it actually provides today's date. So tomorrow, it's gonna say the next date, which would actually be August 11th, and so on. So when I put this in these back ticks with the R, right, this tells my report that, hey, look, <clears throat> I've got some R code here that I wanna run. And so it will execute that R code and then take the output and put that in for the date, All right? Okay, so what does this look like? Well, here, let's go ahead and do a couple things here. There's two different ways I can view this report when I um, produce it. I can preview it in a viewer pane. This viewer pane is down here, right here, which we don't see it right now, we'll see it in a bit. Or if I wanted to, I could preview it in its own um, standalone window. I'm gonna keep it in the viewer pane. Now, if I wanna look and see what this report looks like just right now with the default information uh, in here, I can come up here and I can hit this knit button, okay? Now, I can knit to PDF, I can knit to Word. Right now, I'm gonna knit to HTML. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that. It'll ask me to go ahead and save this so I'm just gonna go ahead and do um, let's say our markdown demo and what will happen now is it will run we'll see this up here and that means it's running through all the code and then now I can see my report here so here's my HTML file that's being produced you can see that I've got my name I've got my title and I've got the date produced here Right, so we can also see now that we have some text around here. We have this R markdown here, right? And this looks like a heading, which it is, right? When we use two hashtags, or we could have a single hashtag, let's just do a, a single hashtag. That's gonna be a first level header. If I were to do three hashtags, that would be a third level header, so we can we can adjust the size of our, our heading by the number of hash tags that we want to apply. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff that we can do within here. And whenever you're trying to get help on how do we write code, like if I want to add a hyperlink, we have that here. If I wanted to bold text, right, I've got here's two asterisks that surrounds the word. And we can see over in the report that means it's bold. I could even do, let's go ahead and italicize. So we could italicize a word by using a single um, asterisk or underscore on each side of the word. So if I knit that, we will see 
now that document is um, italicized. We could even add bullets, right? So I could say first bullet, second bullet, and third bullet. Or if I wanted to do ordered, like numbered bullets, I could do the same thing here. Let me go ahead and copy this. And I could do ordered bullets. And instead of asterisk, I could just do one, two, and three, right? So now let me go ahead and knit this and we will see some updates to our text that we provide. So here we have just non unordered bullets and we have ordered bullets, right? So there's lots of things we can do with our text and there's a great resource under help and you can see markdown quick reference and that'll pull up this report. Um, now mine looks a little bit weird just because I've got um, a dark background and that's just uh, affecting how the output looks here. But if you have a white background, I'll look, I'll look a little bit more normal. But regardless, you can see how it provides you examples for all the different things we could do. Adding hyperlinks, if we want to add an image, if we want to add some block quotes, um, plain code blocks versus R code blocks. It has all this information in here. All right, now the last thing are these code chunks, right? We have these code chunks in here and any code chunk um, is represented by three back ticks followed by um, curly braces and then R, that's gonna signal that this is an R code chunk versus like a Python or a C um, code chunk. And then you can add the, the chunk name, right? So in this case, I have this first code chunk and I've named it cars and then I want to execute this code. So I can just, I can even go ahead and run this and we see it executes that R code. Now, if I were to knit this report, we would now see we have our code shown and we have our output in our report. And we can add different things. So I could add this echo, right? And echo means whether or not you want to show the code. So if I run this and now I knit my report, I'll see that I can add my, the output provided, but what it doesn't add is the code. So this is where if we had a report going to a decision maker um, or a, you know, a stakeholder a CEO, and they're gonna care less about the code that you're writing to generate the port, we can still have code in here, but we can hide that code and just have the output that we wanna show the decision maker. Right. And then at any point in time, when we want to knit, uh, we can hit this knit button and we could also go ahead and change. Let me knit this to a PDF. And now we see our report actually comes out in PDF form. Right. All right. So what we're gonna do, we're not gonna do this right now, but what I want you to do is go ahead and make sure you download the um, additional files or sup, um, supplementary files for this lesson. And you're gonna see that there is an, an R script in there called stock code and then a Word doc called stock text. And what we'll do here is we'll actually work through this and combine the code and the text to generate a report. And when I do this, um, we're going to show you some extra additional features that are pretty cool uh, for our markdown to kind of automate um, the certain process and we can personalize it with different types of parameters. So finish up this, uh, this part of the film and then, uh, or the lesson, and then after that we'll jump into this demonstration. All right, so there's, there's a ton of options with our markdown. It's, it's extremely flexible. There's a lot of great things you can do. You can create a lot of very cool documents. You can create many different kinds of presentations. And in fact, this whole presentation that you're seeing and all these presentations you see in this course are generated by um, our markdown in this Zerigen um, package. Uh, and it, it creates HTML presentations. And we can even do more such as creating dashboards, interactive dashboards. 
Um, you can create a book, you can create blog down, um, so like a website for your own blog, all with our markdown. So lots of great things here to kind of check out. If you want to learn more, there is a book called Our Markdown, The Definitive Guide. Um, and this is online, free, um, a lot of great info. So as you go through this course and you want to create your um, do your homework within our markdown, do your final project in there. This is a great resource to kind of see how you can do different things that, uh, that you're interested in um, for customizing your our markdown reports. All right, last thing here, version control. We don't hit on this. Um, the most popular type of version control is called GitHub. Um, you will most likely use GitHub whenever you go to uh, whatever organization it is after school. Um, it's a way that we can version control our code, store our code, um, so that others can work with you and it provides a very collaborative environment. We're not going to work through, um, through this uh, within this course, but I highly recommend that you spend some time um, you know, between now and when you go to your first job learning about GitHub and figuring out how you can use it and setting up your own account and starting to store your code within GitHub. This is a fantastic resource that'll get you started. Um, it is, uh, it focuses on Git and GitHub, but then also from a, uh, a person that uses R. So it kind of personalize it, personalizes that process with, um, with the use of the R programming language. So definitely check this out. All right, to wrap up, um, first of all, R projects. We use R projects to have a project oriented workflow. I would fully expect that you have an R project set up now for this course so that all the, all the code and all the data and everything that you uh, work on within this course is going to be centralized in a project dedicated for this course. Uh, we use the here package and the here function to generalize our paths. So this is something where if you have paths inside of your code to um, access and import data, well, you want to use this package in this uh, function. Uh, we've talked about R Markdown um, and a lot of the, the great types of reports you can generate um, and how we do that by using uh, or basically combining our, our code with the text um, that provides uh, context around the findings um, in our data analyses. And the last thing we talked about was Git and GitHub and that is all for version control um, and I provided some resources to learn more. All right, so if you got questions, I would say check out the, um, the lesson for uh, this topic. Lots of great material in there. There's lots of good links um, to get you learning more and get you up and running with our projects, our markdown and the like. All right, so we're gonna go through this R markdown exercise. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to combine some code and some text for a report into an R markdown and kind of illustrate how we can, um, I don't wanna say automate, but um, parameterize uh, the R markdown and uh, just create a pretty cool report um, that combines both code and text. All right, so what we're gonna use is, we're gonna go ahead and look at this doc code, right? So this is um, the very complicated code that goes into generating this report. Um, it's quite simple. There's a few new packages here that you likely don't have on your computer. So I would go ahead and do install packages uh, and get those installed. Now, what we want to do is if we look at this Word document, we have a report right here that we want to reproduce in R Markdown. All right, so we're just going to go through some steps to kind of build an R Markdown file that will produce this report when we want. All right, so let's go ahead. We're going to start a new R Markdown file. And you can see that the name of this report is um, Stock Report. Now, for right now, we'll just keep it HTML and, you know, who knows, maybe I want to re run this report multiple times um, in a month. And so every time we run it on a new date and we want to show what that date is. So let's go ahead and add this back, back tick R and then sys.date. I believe that's the right one. Actually, I think this is capital, right? So recall that sys.date just produces the current date um, so we can include that all right so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually delete all of this right here uh, and so often we have this setup 
code chunk that says whether to um, basically we can set other parameters um, throughout this report so in this case we are setting echo equals true that means we want to show all our code but in fact we don't um, we only want to show the output for this report so i'm going to go ahead and set this to false and that means that we're setting the global um, global option of not echoing the code not showing the code all right so let's do that okay so let's just start by copying over some of this text all right so here we have a header so i'm going to go ahead and make it a second level header and this says amazon recommendation by so based on our internal trading algorithm we believe that the Amazon stock will increase in price during the next trading period. So we can see over here that um, there's a couple of um, words in here that are emphasized, right? So we may want to make these bold. So we can do that with the double asterisk. So that's gonna be bold Amazon stock um, will increase. And so here, our analysis may show that a stock is going to increase or decrease. So we want to highlight that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bold increase. So that kind of stands out in, a re in our report. All right. The next thing here is I want to grab this text here. And so this has price history. So this is another header. I'll make this a second level header as well. And it says the chart below is made with the quant mod R package. And we can see that our quant mod in here, if you can see this, I don't know if you can see it well or not, but it's it's got the um, code looking like font to it. Well, we can do that just by adding a back tick. And that'll make it um, uh, an evenly spaced um, uh, type of, uh, of text. We'll see that here in a little bit what that looks like. And uh, let's see, widely used package for collecting and visualizing financial data in R. You can learn more about the quant mod at this website. Um, and so uh, whenever you want to have a, um, a hyperlink, in this case, since we have the actual hyperlink path, we could just put it in brackets like this. Uh, another way we could do this is we could also just say, um, let's say instead of having the path visible, what we could do is say, find more about quant mod at the website, right? And I could actually make website be a hyperlink and I can do that with the brackets around the word we want to have as a hyperlink. And then I could just add the path, which is this quant mod. All right, so let me just go ahead and produce this. I'm going to call it report. And if I knit this, you can kind of see where we're at right now, what this looks like. All right, so we have our stock report, Amazon recommendation buy. We've got Amazon an increase bolded. We've got this in a code-like format. And then we've got our hyperlink down here. All right. Now we see there's some, some graph in here. Uh, we haven't produced this yet, so we'll have to add that a little bit later on. If we come down here, we have some more. So I'm gonna add this method. So this is basically um, a section that talks about the method that we used. And so I make method as a second level header as well. And the main thing here to call out is we can see within this paragraph um, I have italicized recency algorithm. So I'm going to go ahead and do underscore, underscore, that'll make that be um, italicized. And then I have kind of math notation for um, our parts of our algorithm, MJMI, right? So I can do that here. I can actually go ahead and add dollar signs around these. And what that is going to do is that's going to actually make these in a math notation that we can see here, right? And then you can see we actually have 
this notation here, right? Along with here. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. And I'm gonna add that down here. Now, when I have a standalone uh, formula like that, I can use double dollar signs. And then when I do that and I add in this text, which I just got by copying this, that creates that formula, right? Which looks just like we have here. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna copy this as well. And now I'm gonna come down a line and add my double dollars. Oh, well that didn't work out as well. Let me do some reformatting here. And actually this takes a little bit of time. So I'm gonna go into, where's my, I'm gonna go in and steal this. Now don't worry about, you You don't need to worry about the uh, sophistication of this notation here. Just realize that when you wanna add formulas into our markdown, it will take just about any kind of uh, LaTeX type of formulation. Um, so if you can look it up and, I, and find it, you can add it in here and have it look like a formula such as here. Okay, you won't be tested on this or anything, so don't worry. All right, so we've added our formulas and I can even knit my report and I can see I've got them right there. Fantastic, we're making good progress. So now we can say, let's add this last bit of code here, which is a section on the raw data. So this just provides some information on the raw data and let's see oh that looks like it's it's a header all right so we're just going to put this section here we'll add the code to produce this table here in a little bit okay so right now what we've done is we've added the basics of our report now we need to add the code to execute to do the analysis all right so let's go ahead and let's do that so one of the first things we're going to do is I'm going to add a code chunk here and I want to actually snag pretty much all of this. Okay, so what's going to happen here? Well, let me just kind of go through this code so that you can see what we have. So I've loaded my libraries. Now prices, what this is gonna do, given a certain ticker, and actually here I've got Amazon, or excuse me, Google, and this is supposed to be Amazon. So given a certain symbol, this get symbols function, which is provided by the quant mod package, goes out and gets the prices for that, for that uh, stock. We can see it goes back to 2007. Um, and you can see we get the open, we get the high, the low, the close, and a bunch of other information, right? So now this second line of code, this move, what this is gonna do is it's going to look at the last price, right? So this first thing gets all the prices going way back to 07. This last one looked at the most recent open and close um, price. And it looked at, did it move up or did it move down, right? So this bit of code that follows is going to identify, is it, did it move up? Which means like, is it greater than zero? Which means it, it actually gained um, or did it move down? And so depending on if it moves up or down, we decide on, are we gonna buy or sell? Now here's the thing, don't worry about any of this code, okay? If you don't understand what the code is doing, that is perfectly fine. This is just to illustrate how we can combine code and text into a report. All right, so I'm gonna call this decision. All right, so this whole code chunk does the bulk of our analysis, where it pulls data, it looks at the last open and close price, decides did that stock go up or down for the day, and then it declares, based on that, to buy or to sell. And we've got our decision. Okay, so now, based on our decision, we have our recommendation. Right? Does this, should we buy or sell this? Well, 
if I rerun this report down the road, I kind of want this to be tied to the results. So rather than hard code that by or put it in text, what I can actually do is go ahead and say, add this back tick with R and decision, right? What that is gonna do is based off of our findings here that says either buy or sell, it's going to include that here. So let me just run this. And let's see what happens. Well, okay, we see a few things. We get all this information here. And this is when we load the package. We get all these um, messages and warnings and stuff. And we don't want that to be, um, we don't want that to come through in our report. So one thing I could do is I could actually say, hey, look, I want to, I want to not include messages. So I'm gonna set message to false, meaning don't include messages in the output. If there are warnings, I don't wanna include those either. So let's see if this helps. Ah, there we go. So now we don't even see the code that does the analysis, but we see that based off of that analysis, we have a cell, right? So here's the thing, we have the decision there, but we've also hard coded this Amazon here and Amazon here, right? What if we want to run this for Google, right? So let's do this for right now. Let's go ahead and say ticker, and I'm going to call this Amazon. So I can reference ticker here. And then what I can do is I can say R ticker. Boom. And I can do the same thing down here. Ticker. Now what else I can do is see I have this hard coded stock will increase. Well, increase or decrease is based off of buy or sell, right? So if the decision, um, so if else, so if this moves greater than zero, it's decrease. Um, so what I actually wanna do is I wanna make this dynamic. So here, in this increase here, I'm gonna add some code as well. But now if the move is greater than zero, that means it increase. So I wanted this to say, let's see, stock will increase or the stock will decrease. All right, so now that is dynamic. And if I run this report, we can now see, oh, what happened? Oh, and see here, it included the code rather than executing the code, and that's because I forgot the R in that back tick. Let me add that. Oh, and it's still. And that's what we call user error. All right, so now we have that dynamic as well, decrease. So it's executing that code and it's returning either increase or decrease and that is what gets provided in the report. Fantastic, okay. So let's move on here and what I wanna do is provide a plot, right? So remember in our report we have this plot right here. Well, what that is from is from this code that we have here. Okay, so now in here, what I want to do is I want to add some parameters because I want my figure to be aligned. I want it to be centered. Uh, and then I can adjust the height, figure.height. Uh, here I'll put it to be four and figure dot width will be six, All right? So this is just formatting like how big the plot is. Let's run and see what happens now. Ah, there we go. We've got our plot. So now we have the historical um, stock trend that we saw here. And then one last piece of code that we need to add is to show this table that we have down here. So let me go ahead, create an R chunk and I'm gonna go ahead and grab this code right here. 
And then I can actually format what this looks like. Um, and I can format, well, first of all, let me knit this and you'll see what the default looks like. There, and that's not overly um, nicely formatted. So what I can actually do is I can use this package called knitter. And there is a function in there that allows me to format my table is 10 business days now let me rerun this and this should make the table look more nicely formatted and I even add a caption there we go stock information for the next previous or the previous 10 days very nice all right now one last thing I want to show you is that I mentioned earlier that hey maybe I want to run a report um, for not just Amazon but also Google right so what I can actually do is I can parameterize this and how I do that is I can say params and I want to have this be my I'm gonna call this ticker and the choices are gonna be Amazon, Google, let's add Facebook, let's add Kroger since that's a place that I am associated with, and we'll add Tesla. And then what I can actually do is I can say the default value is gonna be Amazon. So now what I can do, I can remove this ticker that I have in this code, and what I can do now is, let's see, you'll make sure. What I need to do is instead of reference ticker there, I need to reference param ticker. All right, so now I can add the same thing here. And here. Okay, so this should work and what I can do now is when I go to knit I can see knit with parameters all right let's see I think I've got some formatting here let me fix this to be aligned to there let's see if that works one thing to note is this YAML area here where we add these different parameters and stuff sometimes it can be a little persnickety on there we go on just the type of spacing you have between the options all right so I could choose my default um, I could also go in here and let me just switch it to Kroger and let's see how Kroger has been doing I'll run it now my code should run with Kroger now I generate my report and look at I've got oh Kroger so the KR recommendation sell Based on our internal trading algorithm, we believe that the KR, Kroger stock, will decrease in price during the next trading period. All right, and so now we have all our Kroger data, right? So then your boss comes and says, hey, look, this is great. Uh, can you run me a report on Tesla? And you can say, yep, no problem. Let me go in here. I'm gonna go to Tesla, generate a new report. <clears throat> and now my report is customized to Tesla, which looks like it's a sell. Looks like everything is, is sell. So anyways, that's a, a, a pretty quick introduction to some of the cool stuff you can do with our markdown. There's a lot more things you can do, but this at least gives you a little bit of a flavor of the different things you can do to kind of automate or parameterize uh, a report that um, really closely ties both your code to the text in your report.